felt like that was a very uh, kind and generous introduction. Uh, please know that I consider myself the privileged one to, to be here, to speak here at the Bellevue Lectures. Of course, I knew of the Bellevue Lectures years before I ever set foot here. I knew of Michael Hatcher uh, years before I was ever privileged to worship with you brethren. I knew of Paul Brantley years before I was ever privileged to speak here. And so I thank you very much for the invitation, for the accommodations that have been provided for us, uh, for the good eats we've been uh, able to enjoy so far and look forward to more of that. Certainly the ladies here at Bellevue, uh, your reputation precedes you as well. And so uh, thank you so much for all you do and for the efforts that are put forth uh, to make this lectureship the success that it is. The psalmist asked in the 8th Psalm the question, what is man? Of course, this was asked rhetorically, uh, emphasizing the low estate of man in, in relation to the high, exalted God. But yet there are those who have striven to answer that question literally through the centuries. Uh, there was that uh, spinach-inflated sailor who said, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. That was kind of his answer that he gave. Some have perhaps tried to be, uh, put a little more thought into it, and they've come up with such uh, wondrous gems as the Encyclopedia Britannica, who said that man or a human being is a culture-bearing primate that is anatomically similar and related to the other great apes, but is distinguished by a more highly developed brain and a resultant capacity for articulate speech and abstract reasoning. In addition, human beings display a marked directness of body carriage that frees the hands for use as manipulative members. Some of these characteristics, however, are not entirely unique to humans. Really, there's nothing unique about human beings at all. You see, whenever you involve human reasoning solely, you're going to have a lot of problems. You cannot answer the question, what is man? But yet we turn to God's divine word, the one who made man, the one who truly knows man, who knows what, it is, what is in man. He can answer the question. And from God's word, we can learn that man is created in the image of God. We can learn that man is created distinct from and in pre with preeminence over the animal kingdom. We can learn that man's life is highly valued, requiring the taking of life of one guilty of murder, that is, guilty of taking an innocent human life. We can also learn that man has an eternal destiny, as all mankind will someday rise from their graves to be delivered to their final abode. And we learn from God's word that man is created not only a physical being, but a spiritual being comprised of spirit and soul in addition to flesh and blood. And we could really make a lectureship about each of these different aspects, but our focus this afternoon, during this next hour, hour right, will be on this last point the spirit and soul of man. Now as we consider this, it will certainly serve us well to consider the words that are used. Those words that are used in the original language in the Old Testament, the Hebrew and Aramaic, and in the New Testament, the Greek words that are used to speak about the spirit and soul. And so let's first begin with the Hebrew term ruach. We might spell that with the English letters R-U-A-C-H. And we find that being translated as spirit in Genesis 1-2. And so it occurs very early in the scriptures. The spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Obviously they're referring to the Holy Spirit. But really the basic meaning of this word is blowing, air in motion, or wind. Now step back for a minute. And you ask yourself, well, what is the common theme underlying these three? Really, they are all invisible, but they're active. They're undeniably present. They're undeniably doing something. They're powerful. 
And this is certainly how the Hebrew mind thought of this word. When they heard that word ruach, when they spoke that word, they were speaking about something invisible but active. And so from this it comes to mean various invisible forces. And we find it speaking about, in addition to the breath of man, we find it speaking to a being that is within man. Sometimes it can actually refer to something that is in beasts as well. Beasts have a ruach, but that doesn't mean it's the exact same thing. Which brings us to the next Hebrew term to consider, neshama. We might spell that something along the lines of N-E-S-H-A-M-A-H. Uh, and this is, all, again, also translated spirit, typically, in the Old Testament. But it's used much less frequently than ruach. It's used 24 times to the 394 instances of ruach. And it's not really fundamentally different from ruach, as it has movement of air or breath as its basic meaning. But it is more specifically human. Uh, Franz de, de Litch made this comment. He said, if the Old Testament language has a separate word to denote the self-conscious, personal human spirit in contradistinction to the spirit of a beast, this word is neshama. And again, it can speak about that same thing that's in the human being, but here this is distinctly human. In Genesis 2.7, we find that being placed specifically in the human being. We read in Proverbs 20 and verse 27, the spirit, the neshama of man, is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Again, God knows what's in us. We have this spiritual being, and this is the word that would be used in the Hebrew. Uh, by the way, uh, the word ruach is also a, an Aramaic word that appears multiple times in the Aramaic sections of the book of Daniel. But we also have the word nephesh. While ruach and neshama are typically translated spirit, nephesh is translated soul. This is the Hebrew word for soul, but more basically it refers to the windpipe opened for breathing, throat or neck. Again, getting back to the very basic meaning of the word. But from there, it comes to mean that which breathes, and in turn, the soul, the inner being of man. It also comes to mean desire, breath, uh, breath of the soul, life, and self. We find that in the Old Testament, this term is used in such a way really to mean a person. A person can be a nephesh, uh, or personality, or life, or as one lexicon mentions, the soul as the center and transmitter of feelings and perceptions. A living soul is what man came after God breathed in man's nostrils the breath of life. According to Genesis 35, 18, when the nephesh, when that soul leaves the body, the human body, it is self-evident that a person dies. It was said of the mother of Benjamin, as she was in the process of giving birth, we read in Genesis 35, 18, and it came to pass as her soul, her nephesh was in departing, that she died. And so it was self-evident. Obviously, if she died, her nephesh was departing. Obviously, if her nephesh was parting, she died. And so we find them those terms in the Old Testament. Let's consider some New Testament terms, the Greek terms. And we begin with the term pneuma. We might transliterate it with the letters P-N-E-U-M-A. And this is the word that typically translates the Hebrew ruach in the Septuagint, the LXX, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, so it should come as no surprise that really this word has the same basic meaning as ruach does. Uh, the Greek word, uh, the Greek root P-N-E-U, again we're transliterating with English letters, but uh, that Greek root from which pneuma is derived denotes dynamic movement of air. And so we have some words that have that prefix, don't we? 
We think about a, a pneumatic drill, a drill driven by compressed air. Uh, this derives from that root, derives from pneuma. Uh, as we think about pneumonia as well as an affliction in which breathing is restricted. But however, as is with ruach, we see that the word comes to mean something quite different than just speaking about air. It has similarities. It's something that's not seen. It's something that's not forceful, but it's not the same thing. So it comes to mean more than air, breath, or wind. As uh, one source mentions, as an earlier Jewish thought pneuma denotes that power which man experiences as relating him to the spiritual realm, the realm of reality which lies beyond ordinary observation and human control. Again, this is the term that is commonly translated in the New Testament as spirit. And we find it referring to the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. For example, Acts 2 and verse 4. Uh, God himself is said to be pneuma. God is pneuma. God is spirit. John 4 and verse 24. That is, as Bauer uh, BDAG puts it, an independent non-corporeal being in contrast to a being that is, can be perceived by the physical senses. And so when God is said to be pneuma, God is said to be spirit, that means he doesn't have a body. He is different, cannot be physically perceived. And this same type of nature is said to comprise part of man. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 now, the very God of peace sanctify you holy, holy, and I pray God your whole soul and spirit and body preserve blanks under the coming of the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see then the spirit is one of those things that is mentioned there, the spirit, the pneuma that is mentioned. We're told that as the Holy Spirit knows the things of God, so each individual human being's pneuma, that spirit that is within them, knows the things with in them. 1 Corinthians 2.11, the question is asked, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit, the pneuma of man, which is in him? Again, that's a rhetorical question. We, our own spirit, does indeed know these things. And so the spirit is the seat of man's discerning. We read in Mark 2 and verse 8, we're told that Jesus perceived in the spirit that the scribes and the Pharisees were so reasoning in themselves that Jesus, they thought, was blasphemy because he pronounced somebody's sins forgiven. Who is this can do such things? Who can forgive man's sins except God only? Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning in such a way. Also, we see that it's the seat of decision-making. In Acts 19 and verse 21, we're told that Paul purposed in his spirit, after he traveled through various way, places, he was going to see Rome also. He purposed that in his spirit. It's described as being the seat of emotion. We see groaning taking place in the spirit. John 11, 33, regarding the death of Lazarus and the sorrow surrounding the scene. But the pneuma, as defined by Thayer, is the rational part of man, the power of perceiving and grasping divine and external, divine and eternal things, excuse me, and upon which the Spirit of God exerts its influence. It's the pneuma that gives life to the body. In Luke 8, we're told about an occasion where Jesus came across a young maid, a young maid about 12 years old, who it was believed had died. And Jesus told those present, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. They laughed him to scorn. But he went into her and said, made her eyes. We're told that her spirit came again and she rose instantly, straightway. Luke 8, 55. And so that then gives life. Thought dead, believed dead, everybody was convinced she was dead, but the spirit came again and she arose instantly. But correspondingly, when someone's pneuma leaves, when somebody's spirit leaves his body, that person is said to be dead. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James 2 and verse 26. But again, 
This is then the Greek term that is translating and equivalent to the Hebrew ruach. That is the part of the human being, the part of mind that is invisible to the human eye or direct observation. Let's next consider and finally consider psuche. This is the word for soul in the New Testament. And this word only occurs 39 times in the New Testament to the 261 instances of spirit. But this doesn't mean by any stretch that the term is insignificant. The Greek term is psuche, which may sound familiar to you. Uh, you can might translate, literate it, uh, P-S-U-C-H-E, or you might translate it, transliterate it, P-S-Y. C-K-E. And so you just bring that over and you think about the, the psyche, uh, which means the human soul, the human mind, also terms such as psychology, the science dealing with the mind, uh, all types of things that come from that as well. Considering this, we shouldn't then be surprised uh, that, that psuche can refer to the mind. In Acts 14 and verse 2, we're told that the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made it their minds. Referring to, that's the plural of suke there, evil affected against the brethren. In James 1, 8 and 4, 8, we're told about that double-minded man by James. You know, that one who's unstable in all his ways. Literally, that's a, that's a di-sukeid man. A two-souled man, a two-minded man. And that's that word there. And as the mind is the seat of one's feeling, emotion, and desire, so we see that the psuche is used that way. Jesus said, my soul, my psuche is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Matthew 26 and verse 38. Now most Christians, when we think about the soul, what do we think about? We think about it as one a source uh, put it, uh, the seat and center of life that transcends the earthly. And it definitely does mean this at times. We read, for example, in Matthew 10 and verse 28 what Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Well, everything that's material about us, everything that's physical, man can destroy. But there's something else that transcends the earthly that they cannot. And we see that this word here is used there. And as is said of the nephesh, again the Hebrew word for soul, and the pneuma, the human life ends when one suke leaves the body. You recall that rich fool, that rich farmer that Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 12 to illustrate the fact that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth, well, he went on and spoke about that farmer who was saying all these things to his soul. But God went and said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Your soul is leaving, and therefore you are going to die. Human life ends when one's suke, when one's soul leaves his body. However, this term can refer to the physical life. Remember that Jesus said that he came, as he said, to give my life. That's psuche, a ransom for many. Matthew 20 and verse 28. What was he saying? Was he saying that he was going to give that part of him that transcends the earthly? Was he saying that he was going to give his eternal soul? No. He was giving his physical life a ransom for many. And so the psuche can be said to be the center of both the earthly and the transcendent life. Okay, hopefully that's clear enough, but that sets the stage for what we need to discuss now. We've got the basic definitions down. How do we then distinguish the spirit from the soul? Now it's certainly clear that man has a spiritual nature that is separate from his physical nature. We find a multitude of references in Scripture to man's spirit and soul that make clear that there's something else besides just our body, something else besides our physical nature. 
But yet it's not so clear. What is the difference between the spirit and the soul? Death is defined as when the spirit leaves the body. We've seen in James 2.26. Death is defined as when the soul leaves the body. Genesis 35 and verse 18. The spirit can refer to the invisible nature of man that continues after the body dies. So can the soul. They both can. As Thayer puts it this way, he says, For the most part, the words pluma and psuche are used indiscriminately. But that said, one can make a distinction between the two. Again, consider that threefold division of man that Paul presented. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Three, three separate parts. He didn't say your spirit, which is your soul and your body. No. Just as the spirit is distinct from the body, just as the soul is distinct from the body, soul, the soul, and spirit are, are distinct from each other. In Hebrews 4 and verse 12, Speaking about the power of the Word of God, we find the writer saying there, For the Word of God is quick, or living, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, let's speak about how precise, how powerful that Word of God is. And it is able to make discernment where it's not readily obvious, not easy. And so we acknowledge that it's not easy to discern the soul from the spirit, but as one looks to the word of God, one can make the distinction. The words translated spirit, again the Hebrew and Aramaic ruach and the Greek pneuma, refer to the invisible but active force within a person. And so especially as we look to the Greek term pneuma, this is exclusive of the human body. And we find oftentimes Paul will speak about the dichotomy between the two, perhaps to illustrate other things, but certainly the two are seen as being separate from each other. However, the term soul is not necessarily exclusive of the human body. The Hebrew nephesh or soul refers to the life force within a person. And it often includes the whole person, including his body, as long as life is in him. When life is in him, as long as that person is alive, really that soul includes his body. As one mentions, in fact, nephesh, that Hebrew term for soul, is so identified with the whole person that ironically it can denote a non-breathing corpse. What we find in Leviticus 21.11, Neither shall he go into any dead body, or literally dead nephesh, or dead soul, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Now, this isn't the normal usage of the word at all. This is a very uncommon usage. But it does show us at the very least that the term nephesh, the term soul, can include the physical body. One reads of those who are seeking other people's nephesh. For example, one reads of those who are seeking Moses' nephesh. Moses' soul, literally. One can literally translate Exodus 4.19, And the Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy soul. Nephesh is the word being used there. But the late Pharaoh and other Egyptian leaders... Uh, they weren't trying to possess Moses' eternal spirit. What were they seeking? They were seeking Moses' physical death. You, you perhaps heard the cry, Save Our Souls. It's commonly associated with the SOS signal, although technically it's not meant as an abbreviation, but it's commonly associated with it. But when that SOS is given, when the cry, Save Our Souls, is made, what is it for? It's typically thought of as a signal for in times of physical distress when people are asking for their physical lives to be saved. And so soul can refer to the physical life. When, Paul, when uh, Peter wrote that during the flood, eight souls were saved by water, 1 Peter 3.20, referring to the time of the flood. What's being said there? 
was referring to spiritual salvation. Ultimately, he was referring to the fact of their physical salvation. Their physical lives, Noah and his family's physical lives were spared by means of the ark. While all flesh died that moved upon the earth and every man, Genesis 7, 21. And so we need then to understand that nephesh, psuche, soul can be broader. Really it can refer to the person, the living person. Guy in Woods, there's a quote in the book I'd encourage you to read. Uh, he spoke, speaks about how certain materialists will get, try to get Christians and uh, different people who believe certain truths about the Bible to affirm that the soul never dies. Ask you the question, is it true that the soul never dies? I think probably everyone of us will say that's a true statement. The soul never dies. But then what they do is they go back to the Old Testament and they show these different passages which show that the, the soul does die. But what that is is speaking about something entirely different. This is what is known as the fallacy of equivocation. Where you use a, a term that has different definitions and people are using different meanings to apply. You know, imagine, for example, I say, uh, Brother Carl, I say, uh, it's true that a bat's made of aluminum or wood, right? And he, said, he says, that's right. Or, you know, he's, he's pretty perceptive. He says, well, the college bat's actually made of a composite material. So, okay, okay. And so, so bat's made of wood, aluminum, or composite material. And so I say, aha. Then it's true that a little furry winged creature cannot be made of flesh and blood. He has to be aluminum, he has to be wood, or he has to be composite material. That's the kind of thing that you find people trying to do. We need then to be aware of the different uses of the term soul. That soul can have different meanings. Now it's true that the soul in the sense of the physical human being will die. However, this does not prove that the soul when it's defined as the seat and center of life that transcends the earthly will die. That will never die. And so, to summarize what we've been saying, the soul is roughly equivalent to life. The spirit in man that gives him life can be called his soul, and so you can see in some ways the terms can be used, the term spirit and soul can be used synonymously. However, as the body is alive, the body is considered part of the soul as well. But... The spirit is very specifically the immortal identity of man that is not subject to physical death. That's when we're being specific. We're discussing the spirit. Now in light of the theme of the lectureship regarding realized eschatology, it's worth noting that the spirit and soul are capable of evil. And seeking to disavow that a bodily resurrection of the dead is yet to come, a realized eschatologists have adopted false views of the spirit and soul, uh, particularly in relation to the body and flesh. Uh, many realized eschatologists have bought into really a, a Gnostic form of dualism, uh, which says that flesh is inherently evil, but the spirit, they say, is incapable of evil. The spirit simply cannot sin. And this is how realized eschatologist Kurt Simmons comes to his conclusion that angels, being spiritual beings, are incapable of sin or even being tempted to sin. Uh, this is how he puts it. He says, angels cannot sin. The seed of all sin is the flesh. Romans 7, 18. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. James 1, 14 through 15. Since angels are spirit and not flesh, they cannot be tempted with sin. That's the argument that is being made. Now the perceptive Bible student would quickly respond with 2 Peter 2.4. For God, if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness preserved unto judgment. Notice that it speaks about the angels that sinned. That's pretty clear, is it not? 
this verse really couldn't be any clearer. However, in a classic case of the tail wagging the dog, Simmons explains away what this verse plainly teaches by claiming that angels in this verse actually means messengers. God spared not the messengers that sinned, but cast them down. He'll go on to say, the angel, hence the angels in this passage are best understood not as supernatural beings, but men. Specifically, they are the sons of God, descendants of Seth, who married and made affinity with the daughters of unbelieving men, descendants of Cain, before the flood, Genesis 6, 1 through 4. This is clear from Josephus, who first refers to the descendants of Seth, saying they obeyed God for seven generations, but then calls them angels, and says they apostatized from God by marrying unbelieving women. Uh, here we see that he's using the terms, again, falsely and kind of interchanging terms in the way that he feels appropriate. And really, as he's citing Josephus to prove his point, you're familiar with Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and following, where it speaks about the sons of God who took themselves, made wives of the daughters of men. Well, you can understand from the context what is taking place, that the context is speaking about the descendants of Seth took to themselves wives that were descended from the line of Cain. That's what the context certainly indicates. But Josephus was not taking that view. He literally believed that those were literal angels being spoken of there. And so that's not what he was saying at all. And uh, again, you'll have to read some things in the book about that. Uh, but note as well that they that uh, realized eschatologists will speak about the serpent as figurative. They find themselves forced to explain away Satan. Satan is a spiritual being as well. How can Satan then sin if he is spiritual? They will go again so far as to say that in Genesis chapter 3, when we read about that serpent, that is figurative. That's not real. Now it's Interesting that Simmons, who makes that statement, and by the way, Don K. Preston claims that Jesus has indeed cast Satan into hell and broken his power, but Simmons denies that there ever was a real uh, personal devil in the first place, speaking of him merely as a metaphor for sin and death. But he affirms in his preterist statement of faith, advancing realized eschatology, says, we believe that the historical narratives of Genesis were intended to affirm the truth of the facts that they recite. We deny that the historical narratives of Genesis can be interpreted, interpreted by the same principles as the poetic language and imagery of the prophets. God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is in the space of six evenings and mornings, 24-hour days. Sounds good, right? Adam and Eve were the first created human beings. All men trace their descent from the common biological parentage of Adam and Eve. And so he's saying Genesis 1 through 3 is literal. But if you're going to affirm that that's literal, that serpent in Genesis 3, why would you say that that is figurative? Only a vain effort to justify a false doctrine would compel anyone to do such. It's like the one who went out hunting for squirrels and sadly couldn't find many squirrels out in that field and so he just started shooting at everything and calling it squirrels. That's what they're doing. That's what the realized eschatologists are doing and they're shooting up the field and calling it squirrel hunting. You know, if angels and Satan, being spiritual beings, can sin, that it follows that man's spiritual being is capable of sin as well. As we've noted, the spirit, the soul, is the seat of desire, and desire is what leads each person to sin. Every man is uh, tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, James 1, 14 and 15. Paul spoke by inspiration of moral filthiness, 
not only of the flesh, but also of the spirit. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Now, while the body holds certain appetites that are certainly conducive to sin, but yet the spirit is involved in every sin as well. Let's finally consider the destiny of man's spirit and soul. We mentioned that the spirit and the soul, they leave the body at death, but where do they go? We're told in Zechariah 12, 1, that God formeth the spirit of man within him. We know that that takes place at the time of conception. It takes place within the womb that man has that spirit. But if man's spirit and soul are immortal, and they are. It follows that they will continue to exist in some state throughout eternity. Our bodies were made, we're told, of the dust initially. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God that gave it. Gave it. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, it is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Psalm 90 and verse 10. Some spirits are going to go after death to paradise. Jesus said to that thief on the cross, that penitent thief on the cross, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The same place that Lazarus was taken to following his death by the angels but others will find themselves in torments. That's where the spirit will go upon death. But ultimately in coming in a lecture yet to come, there will be a judgment. When the souls are parted right and left, there will be a reunion of the spirit and soul with that body in its new glorified form. We need to make preparations for that day. We need to make preparations for our spirit, for our soul, which will endure. God created a man a living soul. The physical life of man may pass away, but the spirit, and thus the soul in a different state, will continue into eternity. One can choose to be among the spirits of just men made perfect by the gospel of Jesus Christ, Hebrews 12, 23, or one can choose to be among those whose souls will be destroyed in an agonizing eternal process. Fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10 and verse 28. Friends, we can escape that fate, although our sins deserve it. The wages of sin is death, and all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. But through the salvation offered in Jesus Christ, offered by his blood and offered in his church, we can be cleansed from our sins as we hear the gospel, believe it, repent of our sin, confess his name, and are immersed for the remission of our sins. We then have the hope of eternal life. Our souls, our spirits are prepared for eternity, prepared to enter into judgment. But we then need to continue to live that faithful Christian life. And so if there is anyone here today who's not obeyed the gospel, if there's anybody here today who's a child of God who's gone astray, keep in mind those promises that we have. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. If we can assist you, come as together we stand and sing the song of invitation.